What's up, guys? <laughs> hey, I'm Dustin Ibarra. And I'm Greg Baldwin. And we're podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Welcome to Good Things Are Happening. <laughs> man, it's good to be here. Good things are happening, dude. It's awesome, dude. It's, it's awesome, exciting. Man. This is awesome because like we're doing this podcast and like good things are happening. And then it's like, I feel like we manifested this kind of. What's up, guys? Welcome to Good Things Are Happening. I'm Dustin Ibarra. And I am Greg Baldwin. Greg Baldwin. What's up, buddy? <laughs> How I you feeling? The, I love the glasses, dude. You know, I've been like, I've been putting them on in the beginning of the first one because I think it's like catchy, you know? Mm -hmm. And people be like, what's this? Who's this guy? Let's watch this podcast. <laughs> it's like, ah, I'm not that crazy. <laughs> Dude, uh, how's it going? What's going things on? Things are good, man. Yeah. Life's good, dude. What can I say? What's uh, uh, what's going on good in your life today? What? Okay, what is going on good in my life right now? I had I had a drain issue. My sink was uh, stopped up, mm -hmm. and I called a plumber. Mm -hmm. And the first guy was like, "It's gonna be twenty five hundred dollars." And I'm like, "Whoa, this is insane! Wow, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to not use there? the sink." I don't. That's what they always ask too. You notice when you call a plumber, they're always like super, like they talk to you like you're an idiot and stuff. <laughs> like they look at the drain and then they look at you and it's like, "Whoa." You know, you can't put bones down here. I'm like, oh, really? I can't put bones? I, I've been throwing shoes down there. And I put some a two by four the other day. It's like, yeah, I know I'm not supposed to put bones. And then they, they just judge you and yeah. stuff. And I put a dead body in there. Yeah, there's a dead body. There's bones. It's like the French catacombs down there, dude. There's a lot of bones. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, the first plumber was like, it's going to be 2,500. And I'm like, oh, my God. But then... Got another plumber, and he's doing it like right now as we speak for like two hundred bucks, man. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's awesome, does, dude. Does the landlord pay for it? Or landlord pay? does pay for oh, okay, it. Okay, that's yeah. good. Plumbers are so interesting, right? Because they're so kind of like very cocky with their mm -hmm. job. They like because they know something you don't. It's kind of like a mechanic, <laughs> you know. They know, and you don't know if he's like like. The first thing he asked me, he was like, "Did you use Drano?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I used Drano." And he was like, "Oh," <gasps> apparently, like. It's Drano's a big no-no. Really? Yeah. It, it, the plumber like freaked out. He's like, you can't use Drano. You know how bad it, bad it is for the pipes? And I'm like, well, dude, uh, why do they sell it then? You know? Yeah. Like, because it's called Drano. Yeah. It's like, and I didn't use Drano. That's what I, used, I would have thought. Yeah. I used the off-brand. It was like <laughs> just some like $2 <laughs> thing that you tossed <laughs> down there. Uh, I, you got to have a lot of respect for plumbers. The kitchen's fine, but when they yeah. got to do the bathroom... Oh, if it was a toilet, I yeah, couldn't be yeah, there. Yeah, I would be tough. like, you got to meet. I'm so, going to leave the key under the door. When I was in college, we had a backed up toilet. And all yeah. we did, we were college students. So we just shut the door for like a month. <laughs> <laughs> you just left <laughs> it? Just, yeah, we, we had two bathrooms. Nobody used that bathroom. And then you opened up the door and it was the most, oh. Oh, it was just terrible. So we had to call a plumber. And that poor plumber, man. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, man. I felt bad for him. Did you guys have to, like, meet him at the door and yeah. stuff? I wouldn't even been there. Yeah, we, like, like, evacuated the house for, like, three days to make sure to let the oh, smell Oh, my God. Out. That, oh, that's college terrible. waste, too. That's disgusting. <laughs> that's Taco Bell and Carl's yeah. Jr. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, how, but, yeah, so life is good right now. I got that's a good. clean drain. Um, it wasn't that much. What's up with you? Uh, so God, what is going on with me? I, um, I just did, uh, you know, I speak in jails about yes. recovery and, uh, very like, cool. Yeah. And, uh, I've done it over like 300 times and, uh, mm -hmm. um, I became the director of it and I've got like a lot of people I know cleared and, uh, to go speak in there, but I brought somebody in, uh, for their very first jail panel, uh, Jay Moore. Ah, nice. So I bet you Jay did good. He did he killed Yeah, he he's, killed. Yeah, he's a professional. You know. Yeah. So he uh, he brought me to a prison panel a couple months ago. We went to Santa Barbara and we did it with a, in a prison, and uh, which was just phenomenal. It was my actually my first time in a prison, not a jail prison. In Santa Barbara. In Santa Barbara. Oh, yeah. I bet you that's a nice prison. Yeah, Santa Barbara was nice. Like, it was nice. You know yeah. what I noticed in the in the 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 difference between the jails and the prisons is the prisons they've already been sentenced. So they've come to terms with their sentence and they're a lot more freer and relaxed. Yeah. And when we go into the jails, there's a lot more tension and anxiety because 
they have court cases they're you know uh they don't know how long they're gonna be in there yeah and so forth but i brought jay in for the first time and uh it's just phenomenal. You know, we walk in. I have a non-escort pass where I can walk around the jails with no escort, which is just baffling to me. Do you wait? You can just like walk around. Yeah. You can go places and yep. no one. Oh, that seems. So you have to have a dangerous. reason to be in there because you got to check in and stuff. But yeah, uh, it, I have a green pass and uh, which is a non-escort. And, you know, I've been in there over 300 times. And every time I walk in there, it's still just baffling, you know. And um, actually, when I first got I became the director of jails for the program. Uh, the sheriffs took me out to lunch and I'm sitting in the back of a sheriff's car. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I said, we're on our way to lunch, uh, the, the welcome me in. And I said, uh, I said, you know, three years ago I was, uh, smoking meth and in, in the, in the back of a, a cop car <laughs> getting arrested. <laughs> and they just looked at me like, Oh my God. Like wow. it wasn't funny to them. I thought it was hilarious. Well, that, that's a cool turnaround, man. Yeah. You were in the back of the car yeah. for like drugs. And now it's like, you're going in and helping people. And stuff. Yeah, no, it's amazing. So, and you know what the real magic of it was mm -hmm. is, uh, I've done it so many times. It's incredible for me, but watching somebody else's lights turn on the first time. That's awesome. You know, and getting to bring him in for the first time and watching him have experience. And, you know, there's like, I don't know, 20 women, 25 women. Mm -hmm. And we shared our story and, and Jay just killed it. He That's just, great. He just killed it. Have and you ever had someone like come up to you that got out of prison or yeah. anything? Or that mm -hmm. You've met them like on the outside? Yeah. So what happened, I was in, uh, I was, I, I went to this jail pen on this kid uh, I had met a few months in a row and he said, I'm getting out on Friday. What should I do? And I said, well, come meet me at this recovery meeting. So on a Friday and he didn't show up, I didn't think anything of it. And about four months later, I was at this recovery meeting and I see this kid staring at me. Right. And I didn't mm -hmm. recognize him. And he comes running over to me. I'm like, Hey man. And he's like, do you remember me? And I'm like, no. And he's like from jail. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh my God, dude. Yeah. What's up, man. And he goes, he goes, I got out. He goes, I started drinking again. Uh huh. He goes, I hit another bottom. And uh, so I came to this meeting looking for you, but you weren't here. He goes, I raised my oh. hand as a newcomer and uh, all these people surrounded me. They got me into a sober living. He goes, I'm sober three months. Dude, that is and, awesome. And That's then, like a great story, man. And a year later, he was a speaker at the recovery at a recovery meeting. I was sitting in the back. He Dude. shared his story, how he said someone brought in a recovery meeting to the jail uh -huh. and uh, uh, introduced him to recovery. And he said, that person saved my life. And he looked at me and he smiled. Oh, my God. And uh, he's now 14 years, 13 years sober. And uh, we still connect sometimes. And uh, that's it's just, great. It's just, you know, it's just incredible. That's inspirational, so, man. Yeah. And man, now I'm like, I'm like, man, I should have had something better than my plumbing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like my drains are clean. You're like, you're, I saved someone's life. Yeah. I'm you're like, Oh, OK. <laughs> you're doing great, dude. I'm Thanks, I'm man. proud of you, man. I'm Speak happy, bro. Speaking of inspiration, uh, inspiration. We have an amazing, wonderful, inspiring guest today. Yes, I'm very uh, pumped about this. Yeah, the, a couple of her credits. She was the Booker on the Late Show with David Letterman, uh, introducing introducing talents such as Louis C.K., Jim Gaffigan, Mitch, Mitch Hedberg, Eddie Izzard, which mm -hmm. is phenomenal. Uh, she helped launch the Late Show, Late Late Show with Craig Kilburn. Uh, she was in Comedy Central's Comedy Develop Depar Development Department, where she developed a lot of TV shows. And she was the comedy development in comedy development at Blue Ribbon Content, Warner Brothers Digital Division. And uh, an interesting fact, her mom and dad started the, the very first comedy club in America, the Improv in mm. New York in 1963. And they just celebrated 60 years uh, oh. So please welcome our guest today, Zoe Friedman. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I love being a fly on the wall for your discussion. Clean pipes or clean drains, as not saying as important as sobriety in prison, but you don't have that. <laughs> it's you up can't there. Eat, you can't drink. It's yeah. It, all yeah. small and big. Good things happen. Yeah. So yes. It's about yeah. Acknowledging all of it. Yeah. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you. For having I'm like so excited me. about this because you've got so much like history with like I. You know, the improv, that's like one of the improv in Dallas was the first club that I ever uh, got like a weekend debt, you know, ooh, yeah. and it was always this big thing of like, you just see it. You see that that improv, the 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 sign on the, and the brick wall and you're like, ah, oh, I've made it. You know? yeah. <laughs> this is and crazy. I, I produced my SNL show at the Hollywood Improv. Yeah. Which we'll talk about later because we partnered together on yeah. some shows. But there's an interesting fact that I, I thought was fascinating. So researching you. 
Uh, I know about your dad, Bud Friedman, uh, and he was uh, he started the uh, Hollywood Improv. But I learned about your mom. Yeah. Uh, Silver Saunders Friedman. Silver Saunders Friedman. And right. she, your mom and dad started the improv in, in 1963. Sweet. And uh, one of the one of the interesting stories is they ran out of money, <laughs> so they couldn't afford re more renovations. So they tore down the uh, the ceiling, the walls, and there was a brick wall behind it. So they used the brick wall as the backdrop, and now that's the signature backdrop for all the improv comedy clubs because they couldn't, they were cash poor. Bro, not just comedy clubs. Like, I'll see that in cartoons whenever I, they're like right? a comedy club. It's, it's always iconic. a brick wall. It is a brick wall, and it yeah. was happenstance. I mean, it truly yeah. was. I think it, that is a absolutely the right story how i heard it mm -hmm. and again i i inherited from my parents or even my dad's book or researching is that it was there the brick wall was already there and they had no money to fix it ah gotcha uh, and my dad's a jew and didn't know how to fix stuff so you know <laughs> so it uh you know it stayed and it is so funny that it has become such a uh i cannot iconographic iconic yeah. piece of stand up right oh uh, yeah yeah and yeah, my mom and my dad started together, but we are in the world of history. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, and it didn't start as a comedy club either. I mean, it yeah. was a, a club where people would come after the theater. My mom was on Broadway. She was a singer on Broadway. She was in like Damn Yankees and How to Succeed in Business and Fiorella, like Golden Age, Pulitzer Prize winning shows. And my dad loved the theater. Mm. And he was what they call, and I have to give myself a moment because I say the wrong thing. Um backdoor johnny not backstage backstage johnny <laughs> back, back. <laughs> oh, yeah, my God. Oh, boy. that's the problem i mean yeah. <laughs> the people that hang out like the groupies who love theater yeah, yeah. my dad would like wait for my mom to get off and they would go out uh, like to you know places and they kind of I ideated the idea of this kind of place for people to perform after the theater and then it evolved it improvised itself into a comedy club which i think had everything to do with the time, 1963, things were changing, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, Civil Rights Act, Kennedy was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And it was a time that comedians' roles changed, like political, the David Fries, the, which, you know, it, it has, and my parents were forward-facing people that allowed for political, wild, forward-thinking stuff, you know? Yeah. So I think it kind of evolved. They kind of created a, a soapbox in front of a brick wall, really. Almost, yeah. And it evolved into what it did with love and kindness by my parents, you know? So That's so cool. Because they were just, like, bringing these artists together. Because, like, I, I, like, whenever artists hang out, it's like they want to hang out with other artists and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it just – so it just kind of, like, became a comedy club, that's like I, so cool. I had read, and correct me if I'm wrong, there was a, a, a very famous comedian that said, hey, can I run a few minutes here? Dave Astor? Yeah, yeah. that's it. Dave Astor. And he, so he went and ran a few minutes of comedy, and that started- it changed everything. It right. changed, right? They were improvising. There was a lot of improvis improv improvisation going on, like yeah. the people from the theater, Marty Harvey Freeberg and Richard Pryor, who did stand up, but came and did improv. Yeah. Like, oh. almost like- the, like immersive the theater like they would do it all you know on the stage and kind of through the audience and then dave astor came and he did stand up stand up on the stage mm. and he brought people in and what i heard another little tidbit about that is dave um maybe provided smoked a lot of pot whatever was kind of a provider and where where pot goes, comics go, and prior this is very true. And yeah, prior yeah. like came along with, and then it sort of evolved. And they had music as part of the shows, which stayed until I think the eighties, nineties. Music, oh, it, yeah. the music opened up shows at the Hollywood Improv here yeah. too when we started. When yeah. we, I was eight when my parents started <laughs> the club out here. Yeah. So yeah, Wait, there, and there's still a lot of musical uh, comedians. There's still uh, a lot of yeah, musical yeah, right? comedians, right? And there was a there's a piano on the stage, yeah. which is not usual for a comedy club but yeah. music was very important to both my parents you know did, part we, of the club's history yeah we just had i just had on uh, the snl show dana carvey and he went to the he went to the piano and he started doing uh chopping broccoli and songs <laughs> from oh, SNL that's so cool and stuff and then melissa villasenor she's, she's so musical. she does she does musical comedy and then uh avery pearson runs a music show yeah the 88, 88 show the 88 yeah, show yeah. he runs a music show so it's still 
a part of it's the, still oh yeah. for sure i love that you know i have a show format i'm trying to yeah. sell it has music and comedy to it i'm one i love music and comedy yeah. it, remember because there was a long time where people were like i don't know if they still do this but they were shitting on like guitar comics and like musical acts mm. i love seeing that because it's yeah. different you yeah. know what i'm saying and it's still like stand up but it's like a different thing i like it i like when people take risk like that i you do know? Too. craig, craig yeah. robinson's whole set is on the oh, oh bro yeah. yeah i'm trying to learn the piano just so i can use that one of the improv but i'm scared i'm nervous you know i'm just gonna sit there chopsticks that's it i think when i was eight i was allowed to go in there like during the day there was a pac-man machine in the bar so my sister Mm -hmm. and i would play pac-man and we'd probably go in and play on the you know microphone and piano Uh, oh man there was a pac-man machine there was in the bar you guys gotta bring that back (laughs) i love some pac-man that's almost as good as galaga galaga oh my god yeah me and greg play i (laughs) greg whooped my ass we're in san diego at acc and like there was a free Galaga machine in the lobby, oh, and we're playing it. Yeah. And Greg, I thought it would just be a quick game, but Greg got to like level twenty or yeah. something. <laughs> you and know why? Because I was, I played it as a kid, and then Jay and I went to Denver, Colorado, to Comedy Works in Denver, and yeah. I stayed in the or me and Daryl Hammond in the and in the uh, uh, comedy condo. They had a video game and Galaga was on it. So mm-hmm. and I, I spent like hours just playing. Yeah. It was so fun. I remember that because my girlfriend was there and I remember just feeling so weak. Like she was, I was afraid she would leave me for <laughs> because Greg. Galaga. Yeah. Because I, I got to like stage two Ooh. and she Greg was, was so far and I could see her look. I was yeah, like, oh, she was like, oh. Yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. Oh. This guy. Who is this guy? Ooh, maybe I'm with you the really, wrong comic. Yeah. You really understand the psyche of women. Who are <laughs> 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 it's like, they look at that. They you, they want to provide it. You yeah. See the, yeah. You see the ridiculous thing that uh, things that go on in men's brains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was it like growing up and and around comedy and you know it must have been an incredible childhood. I I think it was great. I mean I yeah. you know you don't you know anywhere you grow up or with whatever you grow up you don't know it's different. You don't understand that people. You know, even through college, like going to college, like I knew Mm -hmm. not I knew my friends from high school's parents didn't have a comedy club, but it wasn't like it wasn't like such a it was a big deal. But and we went after we'd go dancing, we go to the club at like two in the morning. That was when I was a teenager. But I Mm. love growing up around comedy and Mm. I'm in comedy. So it's it clearly got my heart and my soul and not performing. Right. I'm not a performer, but love being around it. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, and, you know, my parents were appropriate, like they didn't bring us all the time to the club and they didn't bring comics all the time home. Mm -hmm. I think the only comics I remember when I was younger who who were in our home was Jay Leno. Wow. Because he (laughs) would drive down from Boston, as he's told many times, to deliver or drive Rolls Royces, which is kind of my dad thought he was some fancy rich boy and liked him a lot, although he was funny, but he came in Rolls, you know, anyway. So and they weren't his. He was just like, (laughs) that's funny. And he left thirty four. Jay tells the story. He left thirty four thousand dollars in cash in a paper bag that he got for a rolls at that time on oh. the state at the on the piano at the improv, and it was still there. He because he was going to be fired. He turned that <laughs> yeah. around. He was heading back up to master anyway. So Jay was the only comic because my dad managed him, and he was like familial. You yeah, know, that would yeah. be in our home. Um, like he would sleep on the couch a couple times, not all the time. And other than that, we'd go into the club, but like, I loved it. I mean, you know, there were comics who probably were above my, you know, pay grade at the time as a kid, but there were a few like an Andy Kaufman oh, who oh, wow. hits for yeah. every level, right? Yeah. Like yeah. adults and kids. But for, for me, he's so imaginative and all the voices. And then he ended up hosting children's cabaret, which was a once a month, show on a Sunday during the day where the stage became a home for young performers, like on Broadway, like Danielle wow. Brisbois, who you don't oh. know, but she ended up on Archie place and like date, I forget other performers. And and my, I think they built it for my sister and I, cause at that moment. And when I was younger, I didn't want to perform and I got to go on stage and do my cartwheels and my sister played the violin. I don't know what we did. So, <laughs> oh, cool. and loved, I mean, and Andy Kaufman was our host and that to, is the insane. audience got wow. to choose whether we wanted Mr. Mean, who evolved into Tony Clifton, Foreign Man, which evolved into Latka, wow. um, or Elvis, right? Which was his Elvis impression. And he would change it up and then he would take us bunny hopping around Times Square. I mean, that is that's insane. That's the best childhood you, ever. Right? That you is know, amazing. Like, yeah. Pretty fun, and you know? I bet you look back now as an, as an adult and you look back at those experiences and, and realize how unique and special they were. Yeah, totally. And have a different yeah. appreciation for them than when you were growing up. Yeah, right. Because yeah. you don't know it's any different until you go yeah. and go, 
oh my God, that was so unusual. Yeah. And what access to, you know, to a, a performer like Andy. You know, yeah, he stayed very yeah. close with my family and I went to see him in Carnegie Hall and out here where we went milk and cookies and this old wow. spaghetti. You know, he always did something. He was so creative. Wow. That's how old yeah. were you when you were when you finally realized like, oh, this is oh. different. This <laughs> I is don't cool. Know. I think it was a slow process. Yeah. You know? Plus I'm like not not like, oh, I try to be humble, but I don't like I don't think about, oh, my circumstance is good or bad. I don't I don't know. Yeah. I, yeah. I guess it has been a slow process. I think in college you realize, oh, right, I didn't grow up like everybody else. And I think yeah. as you get older and you. I don't know, I guess also, I don't know, I guess you're more reflective as you're older, too. You look back and you go, yeah, that was really unusual and, you know, probably not what people would consider appropriate parenting all the time. I mean, again, <laughs> yeah. they were they were just winging it. You know, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you when my dad, when we'd come visit my dad out here after my parents split up and I moved back to New York with my mom and we'd come and then we'd um, go to like Cantor's with all the comics mm -hmm. at like two in the oh, morning can, with my yes. dad. Yeah. And like, I mean, what a, you know, I don't know. I didn't know all 12 year olds weren't <laughs> hanging out at 2 right? a.m. at Cantor's. Because right? you're just doing it was my sister and I. And we'd go. And then when my dad remarried Alex, my stepmom, who I adore and love, she was like, you will not bring your daughters to, you know, she was more, <laughs> you know, yeah. and my parents did okay. I mean, we're not, yeah. my sister and I aren't perfect, but they, you know, we know what's right from right from wrong. We're okay. We're, you know, even yeah. though we've ate at two in the morning with yeah. a bunch of derelict comments. You're not, you're not in a jail <laughs> yeah. panel with that Greg is, that's, speaking that's right. to you guys. <laughs> yeah. I'm not yeah, going to say I'm weren't... still young, but there's time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you didn't, I, you didn't start using math. No, no, no. <laughs> like I did, but that's cool. That is yeah. awesome. Yeah, no, I loved it. I mean, nice. It's a, you know, it's a childhood that keeps giving, you know, the yeah. fact that, I work in comedy still, even yeah. though outside the door, you know, the walls of the improv, it's really like my heart and soul. Yeah, and it was yeah. my parents too. Like I saw them love what they did and I, I wanted in, you know, I wanted definitely to be in on comedy. I knew that. I didn't yeah. know exactly what, but I what, definitely. What, what gave you your start? You know, where did you where did you first start working in the in the field? Well, besides the improv yeah, in New York, the, where yeah. I got to work every job, like answering the phones, uh, decorating from New Year's Eve, you know, coat check. God, girl, it is fun know? working at a comedy well, club too. Again, I, yeah, like, yeah, like I and I got so many skills. I got so many yeah. life skills. Like you know, yeah, work skills at a young age. But my first job was at the David Letterman show, wow. and I was an intern there. And that came because I'm a Nepo baby. Like, you don't keep your job for being a Nepo baby, but you can get a job. Yeah. Right? I got an internship because mm -hmm. my dad knew the producer. I might have gotten it anyway. Like, you know, I applied yeah. like normal, but he put in a good word. And But they don't keep you if you're not. Yeah. At least the yeah. time, I don't have that. The Nepo door's parents. open, but you got to keep You've it You got to keep it, right? So yeah. I was an intern. Um, and then uh, I when I, I went back to college on the first job, but I'll tell you where that spark happened. My dad had come like we again, my parents, my dad was here. My mom was in New York and I was with my mom and we were my dad would come to New York. We'd come visit when after the divorce. And my dad came back east and it happened to coincide with the start of a TV show, which he knew the producer on. And he brought my sister and I and there we are in the front room. It was the first David Letterman morning show. Hmm. He had a oh, morning yeah. show. No, I've seen clips of that. Month yeah. or two or three. And we were there and he brought and he so think about David Letterman as a morning show thing. And it was the weirdest <laughs> I can curse, right? Yeah, 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 I've yeah. seen. But it really, like, if you looked at me in the audience, like I think a light bulb, some spark uh -huh. happened. I go, I don't know what this is, but I want in. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really like something I had never. I loved it. It was so yeah. weird and yeah. funny. It was familiar because it was funny. And I didn't know David Letterman. Like, he wasn't an improv comic. I didn't know him. Yeah. Anyway, that was the spark. And that was like when I was, I don't know, 13 or 12. I was in pigtails oh, wow. with a Spider-Man t-shirt on. I was yeah. pretty young. And then years later, I was an intern. And then I worked there. I was a receptionist for two years in the talent department and I, I worked there for 11 years and I, wow. and my niche was stand up comics and I got, to, it was the it's best incredible. job I've ever had in my life. And I've had great jobs. You, you became the booker. I was the stand up booker, which was only a small part of the job because I had yeah. a, you know, comics they didn't have on all the time. So I had to be, not had to, but I was part of the celebrity talent department. So we also booked celebrities, wow. yeah. which was, ugh. I mean, in yeah. a sense, like, you know, some celebrities were great who actually, were funny or cared about being on the show like Dave's friends, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah. the stand-ups were the piece that I loved and it was my niche and it was the thing that Dave cared about so much. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. he didn't care about talking about the third lead in a Miramax movie, which yeah. by the way, you know why they were on the show because Harvey 
wasn't you know because creepo pushed mm, me anyway yeah, yeah. um but you know he cared about the stand-ups and yeah. i i took it very seriously and loved that job and would have stayed with that job if they didn't make me stay doing celebrities no well yeah because yeah. you're like the perfect person for that because you've seen like so much comedy like yeah. since you were a kid you know it'd be like you yeah. can you can see past everything and stuff I think, you can that's see right. actual... I think i could see past everything i have a great um compassion for comics the yeah. underbelly because i've seen the vulnerability of comics bombing i've seen them high i've seen them i don't mean high on drugs but high from yeah. a you've probably set. seen that too and that too right <laughs> yeah, yeah. high yeah, low right big break something that changes the net i mean yeah. the whole thing so yeah i mean i it took me a while to get to that position at letterman you know because i was a receptionist yeah. first so it but when i got there it felt so right and yeah. it's still because i yeah. feel like i mean this is a little um probably grandiose, but like, I feel like I'm a comic whisperer a little bit because I yeah. know how to talk to comics. Cause I do think, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, and not every comic's the same. So I don't mean the grand generalization, but, but I, but there is a, like, I know how to talk to them. They are part of like my, my like cellular team. Yeah. Think, no, you know? and there, there are like a lot of common threads with comedians yeah. and stuff, you know, like I was looking on, on like depression, a lot of anxiety, depression, anxiety, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> drug uh, use, drug use, uh, insecurity, but insecurity, yeah. loneliness, a lot of them, fear. Yeah. A lot of them don't know their dad. <laughs> and I remember I was looking at a book. They had like father issues. And when I saw that, I was like, Oh, I picked the right job. I don't know yeah. my dad is. This is, like, <laughs> this is perfect. You know? Well, you look at it because you know we get up on stage we want people to tell us they how they love us and, yes you know, we want that all the adoration like, yeah. And, yeah. and stuff but you know it's just like any profession probably there's a lot of mixes from people from different walks of life uh and there was a yeah. uh, documentary <laughs> on it are comedians more depressed than than other people than than other people what, what do you think yeah uh, Maybe, you yeah. know, there might be, um, I, I don't know, more depressed, but uh, perhaps there's a, a, you know, mental illness piece or mental seeking approval, seeking approval or something. Yeah. It could be that common thread. But I, I also think there are different types of comics. Yeah. And there are some yeah. that are very much that monologist that write jokes that have nothing to do with what's going on yeah. inside and yeah. mm -hmm. you could put anybody there maybe and yeah. have them read a read the jokes. Topical. Yeah. They're, Topical, they're good political. jokes, they're crafted jokes, but they're not personal yeah. or mm -hmm. revealing. Yeah. Not and I like those kind of comics, but I don't know if they particularly have mental illness or depression. That type yeah. they might. They yeah. still might want the approval. But I do mm -hmm. think they're it seems as comedy has become a bit more mainstream, and you guys can speak to this better than I can. It feels like there are people that have that want to be a comedians but don't have that that drive that sort of yeah. i need the approval drive yeah. but again i don't know those yeah. comics yeah. maybe to speak to that 100 yeah. no it's true i know for me personally that that was the thing it's been, like it's gotten better but definitely when i started out i had this insane drive of like oh my god i just want i just want to get a laugh i want him to like me i want him to like me and that just yeah. it it kept me up at night you mm -hmm. know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like i would just stay up late and just keep practicing i remember i had a microphone in my garage and i would just keep practicing and stuff yeah. i was like 16 but i had i had that insane like i wanted approval so bad yeah. and we talk about like just the highs and lows of it too you know because like one minute you know you're up there you're killing you feel like oh i'm, I'm people say oh you're awesome and you get you get all this and then a, that goes away you know then you go back to a hotel room and you're just kind of sitting there and then he's like, well, I want the party to keep going. You know, so you might go out, do a little of that, do a little of that. Yeah. And then, you, you know, you'll have a set that's like low. And then it's like, oh, I suck. I'm the worst comic in the world. Why did I even get into this? You know, yeah. which I mean, it's kind of like that. You know, I don't think the plumber who fixed my drain is like afterwards. He's like, oh, I killed that drain. That was awesome. <laughs> I'm the best plumber in the world. Yeah, huge applause. From yeah. All that. Yeah. Walking out the door. Yeah. Congrats, like, oh, you're, you're awesome, going, dude. dude. You're playing the pipes, yeah. dude. And then he, he goes on one and he can't unclog. He's like, I'm the worst plumber <laughs> ever. I'm, uh, I'm so I shouldn't even done this. I suck. Everyone hates me. It's so yeah. true, man. The, the it's, a highs, it's a weird job. You know? Know? It is high, such a weird job, yeah. Uh -oh. The highs and the lows are so dramatic. It's like, if I go away, I do five shows on a weekend. I come back. I am prepared. I know that on Monday or Tuesday I'm gonna have a I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna crash. And Daryl mm -hmm. Hammond and I talk about it all the time. 
there's a crash and Jay Moore talks about it. There's a crash usually on a Monday or Tuesday where I'm, I'm really depressed and, uh, and where, you know, I, it feels like I just scored the game winning touchdown in the, in the, and then you're done. Right. Yeah. And, and, and then in the Super Bowl, and then the next weekend, it's like my life's over. I'm never going to mount anything. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah. I think that's why it's really important to have different tools to combat that. Uh, to, you know, that those downs, you well, know, the awareness, that's amazing that your that pattern has become presented itself. So you kind of yeah. go, Oh, I know I'm going to feel a little bit down because I think part of it is when we feel bad, we're not prepared for it. We go into our sort of survival mode to fix it, whatever that is. Uh -huh. But sometimes when you're aware of it, then you can approach it with mindfulness or, you yeah. know, more sort of, you know, kind of like, oh, yeah, I know this is going to happen and it will pass again. Right. It yeah. will let, you know. Yeah. One, one yeah. of the things I do is uh, it's how we met. Yeah. Uh, transcendental meditation, which we've talked about. I'm a, a mm -hmm. daily practice a practitioner of uh, TM meditation, but you and I were at a, an event with, uh, Russell Brand. That's right. And, uh, we sat next to each other and I, we just coincidentally, just co coincidentally. And we just started talking and we just totally bonded. We did. I was like, you're a comic. Well, I'm yeah. a comedy and we're doing TM together and you're in a room with a bunch of TM people. It's like, yeah. it might be like a sober thing where you're like, everybody's like, hi, how are you looking you right in the eyes? And like, yeah. really, everybody's pretty happy yeah. and pretty content. I don't know if that's like being so, yeah. but my son who's now sober, but he went to a, like a New Year's Eve sober party and he brought a couple of his normie friends from uh -huh. high school. And they were like, that was the best party because everybody was so nice and everybody looked me in the eye and every, like they're used to going to these like high school parties that are just filled with drama and, and not, you know, yeah. But yeah. their experience was like, well, that was really fun. I wish we stayed longer at that party. No, I love you know? that. I love it's, it's like hard for me to be around now whenever I'm at a place and someone gets like too drunk and I'm like it, my I get anxiety for some reason because mm. I, I think in my mind I start thinking back like, oh, my God, that was me. I was that dude who was just annoying and just loud, just so loud, you know, just yeah. like talking to people like we'd be right here. And then I'd be like, yeah, Greg, <laughs> this is crazy. We're doing it. And then, <laughs> your your emotions flip so yeah. fast. One minute you're all happy, the next morning, minute you're sad, and and the next minute you're angry. You, it, it all just goes back and forth. So I do like parties that are like more more stable. Yeah, you know well, what I I'm think saying? that's what they were, uh, you know, experiencing a little bit. It yeah. wasn't probably that mad dash of like, who has the blow? Who has the this? Yeah. <laughs> you know, where, yeah. which is a very strange energy to be around, yeah. as you guys have probably mm. yeah. known. Like everybody wants that next whatever. Let me yeah. ask you guys a question: Who mm. you have done your own work on yourself personally, and that's how we met at TM and Dustin. We 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 know each other from the improv. Mm. Do you think? Do you think there's a perception? I'll ask for your like the perception for comics, and then I'll ask for you guys personally. Do you think that comics think if they get fixed, they're not going to be funny? And did you think Ooh, that that's before you got help or became sober or do your TM or you know your tools? Do you think? Because I think it's a fallacy. But well, I'm not a comic. Because so. Greg, you got sober and then started doing stand up, Correct. right? Okay. Yeah. I was. I didn't drink. Uh, I started when I was 16. I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs or anything. I moved to New York and I got some success and I still wasn't drinking. But when I turned like 22, I drank a little bit, but it was it was OK. It wasn't like the insane drinking, you know, and then things would happen that I noticed like how if I drank, uh, my nerves would go away. I would be calm. And I was like, my God, I love this feeling. Like I would have a show. Remember, I would have to headline and you got to do 45 minutes and you're like, you only have like 35 minutes. So you're like, oh, oh shit, what do I do? How do I fill this time? But I noticed when I drank, I would come up with that other 10 minutes, you know? And so I would start using it as like a crutch. And it was just for, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to use this just to calm down. That's all. Make the nerves go away. But then it it's a progressive thing where it starts getting worse and worse. And then you need it for everything. Like it gets to the point where it's like, oh, now I have to have this just to like wake up and deal with life. I got to like start drinking and stuff. So whenever I went to rehab and um, I was feeling all my feelings again, you know, it was like, oh, this is this is fear. This is sadness. I got to and I don't have anything to make this go away. This is just here now. And I I was working a 12-step uh, program in there, and that is that helped tremendously. But I remember when I first got out, I had this gig that I had taken before rehab. I was in San Diego, and I had to headline. 
And I remember thinking like, I'm, I can't do this. This is, I, I don't think I'm funny. I don't think I'm ever going to be able, able to do stand up again. I don't think this is just in the cards for me because I used alcohol for so long that I don't think I'm funny without it. So I went up and I did the set and I felt very tight, but I made it through it. And then each time I got up after that, it got a little bit easier and a little bit easier. But it was like having to relearn everything again. Like it was having to relearn like just how to talk to people, mm. like just have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Cause I start realizing I'm like, oh, I'm this like nervous, like kind of antisocial guy. But I was out there being so social and it was just cause of alcohol. So I remember I would read, I would read books. I read that book, how to uh, win friends and influence people, <laughs> you know? Just, I remember I would look at YouTube videos, how to do stand up comedy. I seriously, and I'd been doing it for a long time, but I was just like. You mean I, when you got so, you were. Yeah, when like, I got sober. Oh, you were like, re, like. Uh, I was having to relearn oh, everything wow. again because I was, I was, I had to just remember like, oh, this is how you do it. You know, uh, conf just like these little stupid things. Um, but now it's like, now it's great. You know, now it's like, I feel like I'm back. Not even back to, but better than I was before, you know? And I can see it. Like, sometimes all, like, I have these USBs at my house of just like sets, and I, I plugged one in the other day, and it was hard to watch because I'm like, oh my God, I'm so, I'm so drunk right there. And I, th I remember at the time, I think that I'm, that I'm doing great, but it's not, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, alcohol, it has this way of like lying to you, you know? It's like you think you're killing, but yeah. you're, your you're perception's not. off. Your perception yeah. is off. People and, are uh, thinking you're sloppy and, and yeah, and exactly. Terrible, but your mind is telling you you're killing it. And I remember in my mind thinking, "Oh yeah, I destroyed that night." And then you look back at the tape, you're like, "Oh my god, this yeah. is wow. this is insane." The, the club's getting complaints and stuff. yeah, <laughs> and it's like, um, yeah, and it's just, oh my god, it's so much better now. It's, well, it's like a nightmare is over. Well, <laughs> you know I think that saying? answers the question that perhaps you might have thought the same thing. I'm fixed. I'm sober. I'm not going to be funny. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then you have to kind of live through that kind of question and then go, oh no, because that that idea that you're going to take a drink and write those 10 minutes. Yeah. You're going to write those 10 minutes when you don't have the drink now. And they're probably exactly. better 10 yeah. minutes. But yeah. You just, it was fear. You did it because you were fearful that you wouldn't come up with those 10 minutes. Yeah. Right. And you. I don't know. So and then you start using it for every fear. Yeah, right, <laughs> you know, well, right, every, right. every feeling that you want to go away, you got a solution. Yeah, what is but, that, man? What are I don't the know. feelings? We gotta, you know, they're not they're not gonna eat us up. I think yeah. I was so afraid of feelings like yeah. to not run away from them. And and you yeah. know, recently learned even like a shift in language. Like rather than say I am sad, I am anxious, I feel sad, I feel anxious, versus I am. I am not yeah. my sadness, I yeah. am not my anxiety. Yeah. I feel them, yeah. right? But yeah. it doesn't mean like I am them. Yeah. And that helps me kind of not turn my back as much to them and say, all right, let's see what you have. You know? Yeah. Because like, yeah. I think the more we run, the worse they get, right? I the heard more, that, yeah. yeah. Someone in rehab told me that too, because I remember they were saying like in Gaelic, uh, that like Irish language, they were saying how you don't say, I like, I'm sad, I'm nervous. It's like sadness is upon me, mm -hmm. you know? So it's not like connected to you. Yeah. Ah. But now it's like it's like I've got other tools now right. that I wish I would have had before. But things were just like, you know, just like meditation, yeah. calling someone, you know, going for a walk, writing it out, you know, um, yeah. so I don't have to depend on uh, the substances. Mm. You know? You've Good had you. I'm so you've, proud of you. Uh, Thank you. So One of the things, too, I've noticed is, uh, you know, I've always liked to be in the center of the spotlight. And uh, I wasn't doing meth. I mean, I wasn't using drugs and alcohol as a comedian. I did, started doing it when I was sober, but I was a theater actor. I was in the uh, doing that. And I always felt that the adoration and success would make me happy and people would love me. And, you know, and I loved being the center of the spotlight. But recently I got some good career news and um, and uh, which is which was phenomenal. But that that night I woke up at four o'clock in the morning in a total panic that it's going to fail, it's not going to work out. And, you know, and I had a realization, it's like, those outside things don't fix what's wrong with me internally. You know, and it's I have to be spiritually fit, you know, like, like you were saying, prayer, meditation, uh, service work, all these things make me okay, you know, to not be succumbed to those emotions that you were talking about, and not, you know, uh, and be a slave to them. And mm -hmm. the approval and the love that we have to give ourselves before 
before, like, you know, if we're taking them in from other people, it's like a spot, like we need it, right? We yeah. need that. And if we're only getting it from strangers on the stage or you, yeah. Yeah. we need to fill it up for ourselves first. And then it becomes extra. Then it gets to be bounced off of us and still be, you know, upon us, yeah. having it, you know, or whatever. Oh, add, you know, approval upon me versus yeah. they approve me. They love me. I don't know. Yeah. So we know yeah. Let's take a minute to support our advertisers. If you hear the products being advertised, oh wait. Oh yeah, we don't have any. <laughs> oh man. But if you'd like to be a sponsor, go to our website, goodthingspod.com, drop us an email, and we'd love to advertise what you're making. If you hear the advertisements, support who advertises us. That's the way we stay and float. Comedians go through a lot of uh, ups and downs. It's not a. It's a very difficult industry to to, to work in, and uh, there's so many ups and downs and sacrifices that they made. Which brings me to the hat that you're wearing. Uh, yeah, I love that. <laughs> Comedy gives back. I should have brought them for you guys. You uh, probably have one, Greg. I I do. Okay. I do. And uh, in the SNL shows. The SNL, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about in a second. Yeah. But you started. Uh, you know, you've had a very illustrious and successful career. Uh, developing comedians and breaking careers and then now you're working you started comedy gives back what is comedy gives I back? i did greg thanks um so comedy gives back is a 501c3 a nonprofit that supports comedians in need so we are the safety net to the comedy community much like a music cares helps musicians mm -hmm. and actors fund helps actors comedy gives back helps comedians and the comedy community yeah. through financial crisis relief mental health therapy and chemical dependency treatment and community support right we are a relatively new-ish organization focusing on comedians and supporting them and we're learning what the the community needs yeah. you know and we're trying to be responsive and flexible but but financial, mental health, and chemical dependency are three, three sort of pillars in community. Which are yeah. very common themes for people it, uh, in, they, co in communities, absolutely, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, every industry has, every community can take care of their own, right? Like yeah. this mm -hmm. is, you know, my partners and I are all from the comedy space, comedy producers, managers. So we love the community that we're in and that we yeah. are blessed to be in and privileged. I mean, you yeah. want to know like what it felt like growing up. Like, I feel like the luckiest person that I get to be in a room with comedians, be in that late night room with comedians, it's be incredible. in the canters without being a comedian. And not yeah. because I, I mean, it, I have so much admiration for comedy. It's not, I just would be too scared to do it, yeah. mm. but you know, like so much admiration. So, you know, helping the comedians was such a natural extension for my partners and I, and then pandemic hit and we became a pandemic relief organization. Oh, yeah. Cause every mm -hmm. that leveled the, the playing field for comedy because every, nobody could perform. Nobody was making any money. Yeah. And so, the problem with comedians is they weren't making money enough money before the pandemic so they didn't qualify to get unemployment That's and right. benefits mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden they have no job no, no financial support no access to money and and they're they can't pay their rent and so forth yeah you actually your organization actually uh helped financially some people that i know we did i mean we helped over a thousand people in pandemic wow. which was if we didn't have the pandemic and i wish we didn't but we helped maybe 40 comedians a year outside of pandemic, right? So, yeah. hey, I'm a comic. I need mental health. I'm depressed. We yeah. recently had somebody who couldn't get off their, their out of bed and we got mm -hmm. them to a psychiatrist and, you know, Amazing. they're feeling so much better and back, you know, all of that. Like, hey, I'm a comic on the road. But we get like 40 maybe in a year where we in the pan first year of pandemic gave over a thousand, we helped over a thousand comedians. So the quantity with less money, like with a, you know, a smaller grant for pandemic, but we were able to touch appropriately a lot yeah. more comedians. And now we're back to our initial vision, which is more like a music care. It's like, Hey, I'm a comic. I've fallen on hard times. My partner's sick. Yeah. Or, uh, my car broke down and I can't go on my road tour. And then we pay the mechanic, get them. You know, our it's whole amazing. job is to get comedians back to do what they do best, which is make people laugh because truthfully, comedy is the heart and soul of this world we need yeah, to laugh together laugh. it heals it brings us together it's community building it's uh, endorphins it's all of it like we want to raise the vibration of the planet through comedy and i'm not a comedian so the way we could do it 
is lift and rise comedians up to get back to do what they do best. Yeah. And me personally, comedy gives back. I'm I'm like so grateful for it. It pretty much saved my life because towards the end of my drinking and using, it got so dark. And so I was like a daily drinker, almost daily blackout drinker. And I wanted to quit. I, I was at that point where I wanted to quit, but I, I couldn't. You know what I'm saying? Like I had to have the physical separation. So uh, Comedy Gives Back uh, got me into rehab, wow. which was the best thing. It was like the best thing I've ever done in my life. I wish it, I would have done it sooner. It was, it changed the trajectory of my life completely. And it made my life better and everyone's life around me better. Um, it's, it's an amazing thing. And um, I'm just so glad there's like a service out there that does that. You guys pr 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 like paid for my rehab and um, I'm forever, I'm like forever yeah. grateful for You're that. You're a good because, case study, Dustin. Yeah. And I thank you for saying that because I know it's not easy. And the thing is we help a lot of comedians with stuff they don't want to talk about, right? Like, yeah. there's, hey, I need help. Nobody wants to go, guess what? I need help. And I went, yeah. you know. No, yeah, right? totally. Like, so and like, I really I, yeah. appreciate you being so yeah. forthcoming with it because you are a perfect case study and story of what comedy gives back wants to do. And our purpose and sole reason is to get, and I saw your tonight show. I <laughs> yeah, think it was so crazy. good. And just to have like, that is the milestone as we get to talk today on that is so beautiful. And we're so happy that we, and you have good friends around you too, because mm -hmm. you didn't come to us. Somebody else came to yeah. us. And we were able to put it together and help you and find the right place and pay for it and we're thrilled that we could help and we please if you're a comic or in the community and you need help please 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 reach out yeah and that's why i do talk about it i've been like talking it's about important. it on stage because it's like there are people out there in the same boat that like don't know and there is help out there it can be done and since since i got sober my my life is just it's it's been amazing. There's there's ups and downs, of course, but no yeah. down like it was before. We you know manageable maybe it, right more yeah. manageable. Yeah. Everything has a solution now. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like and I feelings come and they're good and bad, but it's like I can deal with them now. And, Everything has a solution. Um, I think is exactly the mentality that's like resilience, right? Like I had an eating disorder as a teenager. And my mother was very pro therapy. Thank God. One of my best friends wrote me a letter saying. I saw how upset you were that you ate a cookie and you shouldn't let food control your life. And I just burst into tears because I was anorexic. I wasn't eating and, but I wasn't talking about it with anybody, mm -hmm. you know, secretive, right? When we have our stuff, we keep it secret or yeah. things you are, but I was like 95 pounds and you know, that's weird how people just know. But yeah. The, you know, she yeah. saw yeah. it and she was so wise. This is like my Jaxie Israel. I'll shout her out. She knows, mm -hmm. um, you know, we were, I don't know, 15, she 14. And she wrote this, made this letter and I showed it to my mom and my mom's like, I'm on it. And she got me into therapy. And besides resolving my eating disorder, which was all mostly about control a little bit, I think with my parents' divorce and you can control your food and that's all, you know, I went to therapy and things got better. And I, yeah. from now on, besides the tools I got in therapy, I think my mindset is there's always a solution. There's always it's, some, like I can get help. Yeah. Like that therapist was good enough. My found, mom found the right person. And I was like, I was cured or, you know, I'm, I still go to therapy. Trust me, I'm not yeah. cured, but I believe there's always a solution. And that's a mindset thing. That yeah. is a mindset. I think that you will then go on because there's, because you're not going to be stumbling from something. And if you stumble, you go, I know how to figure, I, yeah. I can figure this out. I might not know exactly, but I'll figure it out. I, I know there's ways to get me better when I'm feeling bad, you know, like yeah. I have my tools, what? I have like, I, I know there's therapy out there if I'm not in it, which I'm usually in it most of my life. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, and it does take like a little action, like reaching For out. Sure. I remember I would like, just lay in one. bed and just be like, Oh God, help me not be a drunk anymore. Yeah. But it's like, you actually yeah. have to take well, steps. That's true what, too, yeah. One of the obstacles I think too, cause I mean, I can say probably pretty honestly that suicide is, uh, is prevalent in the comedy community. Yeah. We see yeah. a lot of comedians commit suicide. And the hard part, and, you know, I deal with some depression. I'm not suicidal, but, you know, I periodic depression. The hard part is getting to the point where you're willing to ask for help. That is so You know, hard. because I'll be stuck and I'm like, I don't want to burden my problems on somebody else. And then I revel them and then they, I get more depressed and it gets worse. Yeah. 
you know, so it's Dustin and I have been really good. You know, first of all, I want to thank Comedy Gives Back because you gave me one of my best friends. We oh. wouldn't. Yeah, it is like this guy. You, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Greg's helped me so much. Oh, like, he's and the best. We he's wouldn't. Best. We wouldn't be sitting here today without Comedy Gives Back. The whole. The whole reason we've had this yeah. had this show is because of you. Oh. Yeah. You no. Know? Totally. Oh. That's why. We and everything in my life, pretty much. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Happening. But you know, it's you get to a point where you're so depressed, and I don't want to. You don't want to burden people with your problems. So it's good to know that comedy gives back is there for people and you know what have enough courage to reach out you know and you don't have to know the answer you don't yeah. have to know the question yeah you just email help at comedy gives back.com okay and somebody will get back to you and if we don't have the resource we'll find the resource yeah and everything is anonymous unless you don't want it to be like dustin here and he speaks to us so i appreciate yeah, that yeah but we keep it in great confidence but yeah i think it is the hardest thing is to ask for help yeah. for anybody yeah. like especially yeah. stand-ups hi yeah. i'm alone on stage doing yeah. this by myself i got this right yeah. like yeah. in our heart kind of our log line or our sort of tagline is you know the job of the comedian is to be alone on stage but feeling alone off stage unacceptable yeah that is what we're trying to change because especially stand-ups and i would say if we talk about mental health of comics or is depression more prevalent <coughs> <coughs> I don't know 100%, but what I do know is it's a solitary job and there's a reason you guys are stand-ups and you're doing yeah. it on your own. Mm -hmm. And to, I think that mentality is much harder to ask for help with yeah. that. Yeah, it mm -hmm. is. It's uh, So oh, excuse me. it's just good for, for anybody listening to know that help is available and comedy gives back for comedians, but there's also suicide hotlines. There's therapist 988 988 mm -hmm. yeah and uh i will can i can i speak what services we have yeah yeah so apart from what we've been talking about here like chemical dependency treatment that might be your thing we do offer comedians a free month of better help mm -hmm. through comedy is back so if that is a way to start uh if you have a therapist that you already are in and can't afford treatment, come and apply. We will help you pay for it. Mm. If you're with doctors and your insurance is ending and you're going to lose access to your therapist, your psychiatrist, and you're going to lose it and you need your help with paying your premium, we could help you with that. Chemical dependency. We have a monthly meditation at the comedy store, the third yeah. Wednesday of every month. Phenomenal. Um, which is great and led by uh, Tim Duffy. Um and uh, Greg and I have, and Dustin went the last time. Yeah. And it's pretty. It's amazing. It's not even pretty. It is it's amazing, amazing. It's amazing. And life changing. Yeah. And so there's that. There's a recovery meeting at the improv on Wednesdays at noon, which wasn't out of us, but ours was Tuesday. It used yeah. to be. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think what else we have. We have Health Net. We have this new smart based app for comedians, and we are paying for 100 comedians for the year. And it is not in, not as a replacement of insurance, but it is a low cost alternative to healthcare that meets comedians where they are, whether on the road or at home. So if you're a comic and you have a sore throat and you have the, um, the health net, uh, portal, the app, you can get on the phone or telehealth with a doctor and get a prescription to the CVS in Cincinnati or wherever you are on the road within an hour or two. And you could have access to, there's also mental health. There's self-led addiction through that app. There's a virtual pet care. If you travel mm. with your dog, mm. uh, or pet. So, we have a lot of resources and because comics feel that somebody else needs it more, they're often unused and unutilized. So please don't be shy. Come, you know, come, use, our, you, come use our tools. You, you know, what's so amazing about you. And I know Dustin and I have experienced this as you, as you, you've had so much, you know, tremendous success in the comedy industry, but now you've evolved to a place where uh, you're giving back and you're trying to make the world a better place. Well, we get to an age and we want to like, I, I mean, it's always been in me, but I think it is like, I, I think I'm much more even like committed to it since my parents' death because yeah. I feel like they took care of comics and it was a business. Look, the improv put me through college, a private university. Like it's mm, not, yeah. it wasn't like they were, my mom was closer to a socialist than my dad. My dad was a heavy duty capitalist, but all good. Like, it's not that it wasn't a business, but they cared about comics. That's what I know. It wasn't a business first. It was comics first. And my mom would have given her last penny and she did to comics. Like yeah. mm -hmm. here, you take my, I'll take the bus home. You take a cab home. Like, so it's just, I get to continue my parents' legacy, which you know, now that they're not here is even more important. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're that we love you so much. Oh yeah. yeah. It's, our, we it's started amazing. this podcast and our vi our vision was to make the world a better place through positivity and positive oh, messages. Right. Yeah. And I couldn't I couldn't uh imagine uh, a guest that more fits oh. what we're yeah. trying to do. Totally. Yeah. And you saved Dustin's life. Oh, well, you know? I I I I'm glad I was part of that and because uh like I said, you guys need to do what you do and make people laugh and and I think comics being less cynical as you are in this good things are happening is really mm -hmm. important too, because I think you'd yeah. be funny and not cynical, right? I think we can be sincere about good things in life and be cynical on stage or whatever your persona is on stage, yeah. right? Like, just like you can be yeah. fixed and funny, yeah. you can mm -hmm. be good. And like, we got to acknowledge the good around us, especially these days, because I don't know about you, my yeah. life has been been a pretty big shit show the last couple yeah, of years. No, you, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, you lost you know, both your parents. It's tough. Laws, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, my son's stuff, all you yeah. do it now, but like, it's been a hard, it's like human whack a mole, life whack a mole. Yeah. Come up and go down again, you know? Yeah. So I think it's, I, you know, that's the whole idea of gratitude and thinking about the good things and yeah. highlighting them. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. really important. And even on my way over, I got to think about, even though I didn't talk about, like, what was good? You know, it's, it's just good to keep you know, frame your thinking that way, you know, yeah. like first yeah. or goods or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. So I appreciate you guys are here doing this. You're, the, you're you. the best. The, uh, Zoe, should we, uh, yeah. transition into some news stories? Yeah. Right. Since we, we like to just talk <laughs> about some good things. Cause you know, on the news, it's always like yeah. depressing and shit. Yeah. So there's if like a few it leads. Let's, uh, let's make a new phrase. If yeah. it, if it makes you smile, it's right. worthwhile. Oh! Ah! <laughs> that's that's going on a t-shirt <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Alright, what do you got, Justin? Well, mine is a little silly But it is good okay. But it's not it. like um, Okay, so this super cross rider Cameron Mikadu he, um, he, was, he, he was in this race And he got into like a little bit of an accident And his handlebar Hit his like crotch area it ripped a hole in his pants and he had to finish the race with his junk hanging out. No way. And he didn't, he wasn't injured. Like he didn't lose, but, but that's like, you know, I would have disqualified myself after that. I would have pulled in the pit. This guy finished it, man. Wow, that sounds like I my think. last set at the improv. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, he was in Detroit and uh, he finished the race. Afterwards, he said, I raced the entire main thing with everything out. And then he uh, he said, this is silly. He said, And then he got arrested for indecent. <laughs> yeah, right. He won the race, but he gets it. Yeah, he gets in the handcuffs on the podium. He's going he's gonna to be reaching out. The comedy gives back for support, <laughs> yeah. for mental health support after that. Um, he said, now that it's all over, all out there, I, all I ask is that everyone gives me a break. It's cold in Detroit. Oh! So I guess it was... He wasn't uh he wasn't packing like a Drake, I oh, guess, yeah. <laughs> because that would have gotten caught in the wheel well, and he would have <laughs> definitely uh, caused a wreck. But I think it's cool that you know there's some guy that's, triumphing that's, over adversity. That's yeah, <laughs> that's overcoming obstacles. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, all right, I got one here. Uh, there, so uh, a guy was eating at the Long John Long John Silver's. What year are we? Uh, <laughs> Do, I used to yeah. work at Long John Silver's. Wait, wait, are there still some in the country? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, they're still, right. you're, when you're they're on the still road, out there, good. clogging arteries. <laughs> They're doing their thing, and uh, he took his dentures out to eat, yeah. and uh, and then he forgot them at the at the restaurant. He went home, and he called back to the restaurant and said he left. He talked to the manager, and he said he left his dentures. And uh, she said, "What do they look like?" And he said, "They're wrapped in a napkin." So she went uh, into the garbage. What? And she <laughs> rummaged through the garbage and found this poor gentleman's dentures. And uh, and returned him, and as a result, she won she won a thousand dollar kindness prize. What? Yeah. That Did is he so give it cool. To some, who gave her the money? The I, it, I don't know. It just says then gets a thousand dollar kindness prize. Oh. Maybe Long John Silver's. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. He, like, should, he should be nominated for the Pulitzer for that one. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty that's pretty amazing so, to do yeah. that. Can I just say that when I was like, I don't know how old, the thirteen, I had a retainer. 
and I lost mm. it once and then I threw it out on a fast food tray like it when I was out with my friend. <laughs> yeah. My mother's like, none again. And I had to go back to that fast food vet uh. and do what that woman did and f- go through the garbage to find my retainer. But it's one of those lessons. Oh my God. Like sometimes, yeah. like I did find it, you know, I did find it and yeah. I put it back. I mean, she cleaned it, but I put it back yeah, in my yeah. <laughs> I have a theory too that everyone at some point in their life has dug through trash. Oh. You, you have to. You're going to accidentally throw some away. Oh. You're going to check that yeah. you're gonna dig through some trash in life absolutely i like how they they probably had to call their husband honey i'm gonna be home late why i'm working the grill <laughs> that's silly that's awesome that's funny yeah. Yeah, well man. i gotta say zoe you're the yeah, best zoe oh thank goodness, you so much for coming yeah. this is awesome you do great yeah. things you help so many comics and i'm 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 just forever grateful. And you know, yeah. I forget to mention we, you and I partnered on two. SNL uh, I produced the SNL yeah. alum show at the mm-hmm. Improv, and uh, we partnered and uh, on those shows, which was just a, such an honor to. Uh, oh, I, you, Greg, you're the best. You brought a lot of attention and focus to us to yeah, that audience. It's amazing, and just uh, even with our banner there and just the mention. I mean, it's 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 incredible to, just to be able to to give back and uh, <coughs> you know again you've got one of my best friends in the world sober and we wouldn't be here without well, you. Well, I just think people mm-hmm. also should be aware that this is out there, and I don't mean for the, I mean for the comics and the services, but I mean for people yeah. too to understand if you like to laugh and you go to comedy and you watch Netflix, com- comics live a hard life. You can yeah. give and support. And by the way, donate at comedyisback dot com. Donate or seven zero seven laugh to seven zero seven zero seven zero. Anyway, yeah. but yeah, like it's important for people to know that that comics can hit on hard times. That we just. They're not just yeah. clowns all the time. They need mm-hmm. help and, you know, services. And and it's important to know, cool. I think, too. I know you keep trying to end and I keep going. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I would keep going on forever with you. Uh, I think it's important to know also that uh, the problems that we go through and the depression that we have is temporary. temporary yeah. mm-hmm. You know, and I think when people real think it's going to be permanent and they're always going to be like that, then, you know, bad things happen. So and it's good to know there's an outlet to get help uh for comedians and uh and listen you know i'm not immune to it so i you know there might be a a, a time where dustin or i might need me need help also we're there for you guys mm-hmm. we're yeah. there it's always bad. yeah so it's good thank you for having me this was an honor i really appreciate you guys you're the best Zoe. we yeah. love you we oh, love thanks you so much uh well greg that was fun that was awesome that was awesome thank you guys for listening be sure and follow uh comedy gives back and also uh good things are happening um yeah what you else can, you can what? find us at uh on instagram and uh tiktok at good things are happening podcast mm-hmm. all the socials uh, good things are happening podcast got yeah. some tour dates coming up uh check mine out just dustin underscore ivara y-b-a-r-r-a and and mine's at real greg baldwin and uh just just a what a fantastic yeah movie. this is awesome thank you so much zoe <laughs> thank, you, thank you for saving dustin's life ah! <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna go home with a big ego now <laughs> and then tomorrow i'm like zoe i need to borrow some money <laughs> <laughs> i relent no yeah. just that's not happening that's not happening take that from law <laughs> yeah. right. thank you so much thank Thanks. you guys really that was awesome i'm dustin ibarra i'm greg baldwin find us on social media and on the web at good things pod.com you can also find us on instagram and youtube at good things are happening podcast we're on patreon sign up because we're gonna have some cool stuff on there like really 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 cool stuff so dope we can't even talk about it now. and remember when life gets you down good things are happening good things are happening help somebody <laughs> <laughs>